Hey, good morning, everybody. It's Tim Schur, and welcome to the podcast. So today we're talking about something that's really important. I've got a question for you. Are you a talker or are you a doer? Here's the question. What's going on inside the minds of top achievers that cause them to make extraordinary breakthroughs both personally and professionally? My name is Tim Schur, and I invite you to join me as we take a deep dive into the unconscious mind and discover how to transform your biggest dreams into a reality. Welcome to the How to Be Mesmerizing Podcast. Hey everybody, it's Tim. So the question we started with today is, are you a talker or a doer? And that's a really important distinction to make because there are so many people out there that are talkers. Oh, I want to lose weight. Oh, I want to make more money. Oh, I want to feel better about myself. Oh, I want to improve my relationship. Oh, I want to have more enriching experiences. Oh, I want to feel happier and more peaceful in life. Oh, I want to get rid of this anxiety. Oh, I want to organize my house. And then I'm like, okay, here's what we're going to do. Do this action. And then like, well, I don't have the time right now. Well, I don't have the money right now. Well, I'm kind of stressed out right now. Oh, I don't have any support in my life. Oh, I don't have the right resources. Those people are talkers. The people that are doers say, all right, I'm going to do it. What should I do next? What should I do next? What should I do next? Yeah, I might not have the money for this, but I'm going to do it anyway. Yeah, it might not be good timing, but I'm going to be intentional and do it anyway. Yeah, I might not be getting support, but I'm getting support from you, and I can get support from podcasts and audio programs or find other people, and so I'm going to go ahead and do this anyway. And guess who gets the better results? So I have been in those same situations where it wasn't good timing, where I was totally stressed out, where I didn't have the money, where I didn't feel like I was getting the support, where it felt like, you know, everything was against me. And yet I would find a way to take the seminar. I would find a way to hire the coach. I would find a way to get the tools. I would find a way to get the resources. Because in my mind, it was the only way I was going to get out of the situation I felt I was in. Out of the self-limiting beliefs, out of the fear, out of the stress, out of the poverty, out of the the worrying all the time that I'm never going to reach my potential or, or feel happy and peaceful inside. And so I find this happens so much of the time. No matter what group I'm working with, whether it's in corporate America or I'm working with a group of uh, moms or I'm working with a group of, of uh, students, right? It doesn't really matter what group I'm in front of. I'm working with a group of veterans, it really doesn't matter what group I'm working with. There's always like a top 20%. So there's like the top 20% of that group are going to be the real doers, the people who are really making it happen. And then there's always going to be the bottom 20%, which are really the talkers. They're always just talking a good game. They want this, they want that, they want to do this, they want to do that but they never really put any action into it. And then the middle group, the other 60% are somewhere in between on the scale. And the closer they are to that top 20%, the better results that they get, but they never start getting real momentum and real results until they enter that top 20% of doers. And uh, that is what your goal should be. Your goal should be being in that top 20%. If you're in the top 20%, then you have other goals, right? Then you're ready for the next step. But to be honest, most people are not in that top 20% of doers. And so when I tell them, you know, here's what you do next or here's how you change this, usually what I get back are excuses. Well, you know, we all have a different approach. Yeah, but your approach isn't working. (laughs) And mine is, right? Oh, well you know, that I need to do a little more research. Research on what? You already have done research. You've already looked into it. What you're saying is I have to try to talk myself into it because I'm afraid. I'm afraid that I'm going to, it's not going to work out for me, right? That I'm going to invest money and then I'm not going to get any results. And then I'm going to feel stupid that I invested this money. I'm going to feel like I got ripped off. I'm going to feel like I got burned, right? Those are your fearful beliefs, and those beliefs are probably the reason why you don't have your success. It's not because you need more research. 
It's because you have self-limiting beliefs and you're being controlled by fear instead of by faith. And that fear is keeping you from getting on the opportunity train. And by the time you figure out, I want to get on this train, it already left the station. And then you wait for the next one. And then as the next one starts to pull up, you wonder if this train really is an opportunity train. And then you do the same thing all over again. It might feel different. It might seem different. But look at your actions and outcomes, not just what you're saying. I, I heard a trainer one time, very successful trainer, and she said, check your ego with your bank account. You know, she was a sales trainer and she would say that, check your ego with your bank account, right? If you're doing all this talking, but you don't have the success to back you up, then you're just talking, right? And we don't want to just be talkers. We want to do, we want to be doers. So if you want to uh, be healthier, then check with what you're saying with what you weigh or your level of energy or how healthy you are or the number of prescriptions that you're on, right? So, and then check your ego with that. It's if you're just doing talking with your relationship, oh, I want to make it better, but you don't know my spouse. You don't know our situation. You don't know our past. You don't know what I've been through. You don't know our, my in-laws. You don't know my family. Well, check how happy you are against what you're doing. What kind of actions are you taking? Because most people don't really do anything to change and yet they expect things to change. And that just doesn't work. And so let's look at something else. I was listening to a story about Coast Guards and this is a very powerful story. What if you are a boat capsizes and you're in the rescue helicopter as a Coast Guard member? and you fly to the scene and maybe you're in the middle of this ocean and it's a really bad storm and there's a whole bunch of people in the water and you realize you can't save them all. There's not enough room in the helicopter for all those people. Somebody's gonna die. Who do you save? I mean, how do you, how do you figure that out? I mean, that's a brutal question, right? How would you decide? How do you decide who lives and who dies? I mean, that is a profoundly disturbing question. So here's what they teach you in the Coast Guard. They teach you that you save the people that are swimming towards the helicopter. So that's how the Coast Guards decide. The Coast Guards decide by we're going to save the people who are doing something about being saved. Now, that might sound cold or harsh, but I remember I was 17 years old and I was going through a lifeguarding class. And it was really, <laughs> it got really crazy at times and violent at times uh, during this class. Now, this was back in, oh my gosh, when was it? Like 1987? I was 17 in 1987 and so, but the, the instructor would jump in the water and the last thing we would do after we went through all the training is we'd have to go rescue someone. And I mean, there were like urban legends about this guy, how he would put um, olive oil all over himself so he would be extra slick in the water, you know, all these other things that he would, you know, sometimes um, people would get a busted nose or a busted lip because he'd be thrashing around. And his point was that in the water, when someone's drowning, they are scared to death. They're not thinking rationally. All they're thinking is, how do I not die? And so they're thrashing around, and often their instinct is to grab a hold of anything or anyone that's around them. And so if you're a lifeguard, especially if you're a 17-year-old kid, and you're swimming out towards somebody who is in this utter state of panic, and they grab a hold of you, they will not only drown themselves, they will drown you too. And so we were taught that you have to get around that person and you have to make sure that, that they don't take you out, even if that means they drown, okay? Because if you lose two lives, how's that helping anybody? We were also taught that sometimes in 
severe situations, you might have to punch that drowning person right in the nose. Now you might be thinking, what? <laughs> However, a big part of our training was how to escape when somebody grabs you and pulls you under. Someone grabs you and puts you in a bear hug or a, a headlock. How do you get out of that? Because that's how they pull you under. And so we learned that if somebody gets a hold of you, you might have to physically harm them so that they let go so that you can grab a hold of them and swim them to safety. So I'd rather be alive with a busted nose than be dead. <laughs> and so that's what we were taught as lifeguards. Now, I don't know what they teach now, but I bet it's the same philosophy because drowning and the reflex of grabbing a hold of somebody when you're in terror, that hasn't changed. And so that's sometimes what you have to do. So now I'm, I'm in my career. I would say I'm halfway through my career if I'm lucky and I live another 40 years, I'm, I'm halfway through my career of helping people. And I have learned that you cannot push a rope, right? You cannot force people to grow. You cannot make people achieve their goals. And there have been many people that I talk to over the years that are talkers and not doers. And they have all kinds of excuses and all kinds of reasons for why they either take action or they don't. And, you know, I, I got to be honest, it's been, it's been very frustrating for a long time to, uh, to learn this lesson that my job is to save the people that are swimming towards the boat or towards the chopper, towards the helicopter, right? My job isn't to try to save the people that are just sitting there flailing around because they will just waste all our time and energy and resources. So I decided I was going to start running some uh, classes and I scheduled them out through the year, well knowing that my first class was going to have a very low, poor turnout. And so I just focused whoever, I, I decided that whoever signed up, I was going to take extra special care of them because I know these are the people that are swimming towards my boat, right? And I know that the people that swim towards my boat are going, and now I know how this sounds, but they're going to be saved, right? Saved from their anxiety, saved from their insecurity, saved from the limiting belief that I'm not good enough. And because I'm not good enough, I won't be loved. And because I don't feel loved, I don't feel confident. Because I don't feel confident, I'm afraid to take action. Because I don't take action, I don't get my results. I'm going to save people from that. I've saved probably 100,000 people from that through my courses, seminars, videos, books, coaching practices. And I'm very proud of that. But I want millions. Now, I know that's probably just because of my ego. That's me still wanting to feel special. Me still wanting to make a big difference. Me still wanting to save as many people as possible from needless suffering. Because that's my goal. That's my gig. That's what, that's what lights me up. I love ridding people of insecurity. I want to rid the world of insecurity, but I know that that's not going to happen. I know it's an unrealistic goal. Okay. So that's like me walking into a bar on a Saturday night and talking every single person into not having a drink. <laughs> that is not going to happen. And I'm okay with that. I understand it. But there are people that do want out of this. And my goal is to reach them and to get to as many people as I humanly can to share what I've learned. And these are the tools and the resources that get people out of their pain and into peace. This is the stuff. And then you just got to use it every day. It's like, this is your mind medicine. You got to take it every single day, but it makes you feel happy. It makes you feel confident. As Wayne Dyer, the late, great Wayne Dyer used to say, you know, I get out of bed every morning and do I say, good God, it's morning. Or do I say, good morning, God. Thank you for another exciting day. Because the day is whatever you make it. You're going to have ups and downs. I used to say I have the best of days and the worst of days every day on the same day. But I don't say it that way anymore. I don't interpret it that way anymore. I do have things that I enjoy that work out. And I have things that I don't enjoy that eventually do work out. So that's how I look at it. 
And, uh, and then I try not to get too attached to any of it so that I'm just feeling joyful regardless of what shows up. Because I get so many things happening every day. I get a bit of news that's happy. I get a bit of news that's, that isn't happy, right? So, um, and it just keeps happening like that all the time, up, down, up, down. I'll reach out to a couple clients. One says no, someone says yes, okay, all right? And so that's just the experiences that we have. Right. I'm feeling really good today. And then all of a sudden my little boy gets sick. Oh, right. It's just one thing and then another. And it just happens that way. And that's okay. I'm all right with that because I know that that's just how it is. And so what do I do with it? And that's really all the control we have is what do we do with it? So I scheduled this set of classes knowing full well that the first one probably wasn't going to be a smashing success because you have to approach your goals in a campaign style. And I've done podcasts on this, but you really, to be successful, you have to run campaigns and not one-offs. Not, I'm going to do this once, and if it doesn't work, then I'm not going to do it anymore, because that's a good way, um, business-wise, to go broke. It's a good way, emotionally, to be unhappy. So, I set this class, and I had one person sign up for it. And I've got thousands and thousands of people that follow me. And every time I survey my list, and my list are, are people that I've usually been a part of their lives for many years. And I survey them and I say, what do you want? What do you want help with? How can I serve you? And I always get the same responses every time. I want to lose weight, improve my health and energy. I want to make more money. And I want to feel more confident and motivated because I've lost my drive and I can't even get out of bed in the morning. These are the three things that people ask for all the time. So I'm like, great. We're going to do this class, and it's going to help you with this goal. Then we're going to do another class, and it's going to help you with that goal. This class is going to be on health and vitality and losing weight and feeling amazing and training your mind for success. The next one's going to be on how to overcome that fear and have that emotional freedom so you can start making all the money that you want. You can write your own paycheck. Unless you're telling yourself, yeah, right, well, then you can't, you know, obviously. I mean, you can, but you're telling yourself you can't. And like Henry Ford said, if you think you can or you can't, you're right. Okay. So, but, uh, so I, I say, all right, here's what it is. Here, here's the class, sign up for it. And then, you know, thousands and thousands of people out there and one person signed up for it. Now, who is that one person? Someone who is one of my most successful clients. Someone who has had extraordinary success. Is this a surprise? This person has already reached their goal and yet they signed up for a course that they've been through a whole bunch of times. Why would they do that? Because they're a doer. Because they're successful. They have the right mindset. And so they keep hanging out with people who are getting them results. That makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, I rehire coaches that get me great results. And so that just makes sense. But common sense is not that common. And again, what I'm looking for, my top 20% of people who are going to be doers, the people that have hung around with me the most. And it's not so much about me. I think they're attracted to my energy and my always trying to be optimistic and have fun. But I've studied really hard to attain the tools and strategies. I put them into action every single day. I've made more mistakes than anyone. And I keep learning because I continue to uh, make mistakes and learn and and go into the pain of realizing that I'm not as far down the road as I thought I was. I just keep actively going in that direction. And as a result of that, um, I learn, I grow, my awareness expands, and then I share what I've learned with those around me. And so the people that have already stayed around me the most are also my most successful clients, my most successful students, my most successful companies. And that makes sense, right? The more you're with somebody who's getting your results, the more results you're going to get. You stay with them for a little while, you're going to get a little result. You stay with them longer, you're going to get a better result. This makes sense. But too many people are more addicted to their excuses of why they can't than their passion and devotion to why they can. There's a big difference between commitment and devotion. Commitment is, I'm going to do this, but eventually my excuses are going to make me crumble and then I'm going to go a different direction. 
Devotion is, I am so going to make this happen. And any excuses or obstacles that get in my way are going to be crushed by my total devotion. I am going to make this happen. I heard someone say one time that when it comes to breakfast, the chickens are involved, but the pigs are committed. (laughs) I heard the pigs are devoted, right? The pigs are given the bacon. (laughs) So the chicken are given the eggs, but the, the pigs are given of themselves, right? They are devoted. And so... That's why I think people like bacon more than eggs. (laughs) So we want to make sure that we are really saying, I am devoted to my goals. I am devoted to living my life in this way. And that means I have to be a doer and not a talker. So I'm going to wrap this podcast up with the question that we started with. Are you a talker or a doer? Hey, would you like more free tips on how to be a mesmerizing leader? Then check out mesmerizingleadership.com and also hang out with me on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash Tim Schur. Thanks so much and make your day a sure success.